Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's recall where we were. Uh, so we have, uh, so gamma, this is just the mapping class group. Of the plane minus the counter set, we have R, this is the ray graph. And uh, this guy acts simplicially on this guy. So R, we've shown it's connected, uh, infinite diameter, and delta hyperbolic for some specific delta, delta at most seven, maybe a little bit less. Um, and what I want to start off by talking about today uh, will be the existence of a loxodromic element. So there exists a loxodromic element i.e., so an element of the mapping class group such that uh, phi has an axis in R, so infinite geodesic axis in R, and phi just acts by translation along this axis and in particular, it acts properly on, well, moves everything off to infinity in the ray graph. Um, has a fixed, two pick fixed points at infinity. Yes? Did you never say that the distance between x and phi is bounded from zero? Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, but, but in fact, it's a geodesic axis. I mean, not so important, but this is just, there's nothing special in this context about, uh, having a loxodromic element. I mean, R here is just any old delta hyperbolic space and you have something acting on it where the translation length is bounded below. There's, a, there's an axis or a quasi-axis or something. Here it's, it's very explicit. We'll just construct a mapping class um, and a particular ray and we'll just see that the distance from this ray to uh, phi to the n of this ray just grows linearly. So that's, that's sort of it. Um, all right, so the construction, so this is, this is construction due to, to Juliet Bavard. It's a very pretty uh, example. Um, and so let's recall uh, the way, also recall, how to show the distance is big, distance between two rays is big. So uh, we had R, just some ray, we can build another ray which um, sort of has a, a R together with kind of a sock around it. Does whatever R is, then it sort of does something interesting, and then it comes back and puts R inside a sock. And so anything that R had to cross, this thing has to cross, and in fact anything disjoint from this has to start like R and has to cross what R crosses, so if the distance from R to something is at least two, the distance from the sock to that thing is at least three, and if we keep putting socks inside socks inside socks, the distance gets as big as we want. So this is the strategy, is to just build a mapping class group that takes a particular ray, and the action of it is just to put a, a dish, keep putting socks around it. All right, so um, there's a sort of pretty picture a way to sort of arrange your counter set uh, in the following way. So uh, start with um, a circle, and I want to put infinity on this circle here, and I want to put the counter set um, on the circle in the following way. Um, so the counter set is also equal to z copies of the counter set. together with a kind of a limit point. So remember my squiggles either mean, my squiggles mean a counter set, 
And so we have a collection of cantor sets, which is limiting here, okay? Um, so I've put my kind of, so you can think of um, uh, a parabolic element acting on this circle, which fixes this red dot and moves each copy of the cantor set to the next one, okay? Um, infinity's a problem. So we have to decide what we want to do with infinity. So I'm going to define two transformations. Um, so transformation one just takes each copy of this cantor set to the next one by just moving things around the circle in this sort of parabolic way. Um, So fixing this point here, and then we have to decide how to get from here to here. So we're just moving things around the circle in sort of an obvious way, but here infinity's in the way, and we have to decide, I want to go from here to here, I kind of have two choices, I can go around this way, or I can go around this way. So I want specifically to sort of go around in this direction. So this is the transformation tau. So tau is a mapping class, it just takes so if I like, there's a circle that I got by taking this round circle and adding a little detour, and I just move things around this circle, taking the cantor set to itself by each guy just moves to the next one around it. And that extends to a homeomorphism of the plane, a unique mapping class uh, of the plane minus the cantor set, and so that's an element tau. So tau is in the mapping class group. Um, actually, let me call it tau one. Now, there's another one which is going to be almost the inverse of tau 1, so it's going to take each one of these guys sort of back to where it came along the circle. Um, probably you can't tell these are different colors from where you are. Um, but instead of going back around this way, it's going to go back around this way. Okay, so that's going to be tau 2. Okay, so tau 2 and tau 1 are almost inverses. The only difference is how this piece of cantor set gets to this piece of cantor set. Under tau 1, it goes in this way around infinity. Under tau 2, it goes back in this way. So the composition of tau 1 with tau 2 is so to it's the identity everywhere outside this little piece of cantor set here. And basically all it does is it takes infinity and pushes it around one of these loops. That's really all that happens, yeah? Um, okay, and so the mapping class phi is gonna be very simple. It's just gonna be tau one, tau two, tau one, and because it's a palindrome, I don't need to remember which direction things act, whether it's on the left or the right. Um, so one way to, to, so the claim is that this guy is a loxodromic element, all right? So is everyone clear what this mapping class is? You first move everything around kind of parabolically and you go this way around infinity, then you go back and you go this way around infinity, then you go forward again this way around infinity and everything else just sort of moves around. Okay, so the effect is this counter set, we have kind of a, a, a z's worth of counter sets together with this point here which just stays fixed, does nothing interesting. And each counter set moves to the next one along and it just moves along by a shift except that when it comes to infinity, it does a little dance around infinity. Kind of goes this way and then back and then comes back. So it kind of does a little loop around infinity. So let's draw this sort of in the following way. So here I just have my cantor set. I'm going to draw a z of them. Like this, there's another one heading off in well, let's say the North Pole is infinity in this blackboard. Uh, infinity, the South Pole, is here. And the way that phi works is that each one of these just moves along to the next one. Very uninteresting, except at this particular place, it does a dance. It goes around infinity this way, and then it comes back. So that's sort of the only interesting dynamics is, so to speak, when it gets here, it does this little dance and then moves on, okay? 
Um, so you could draw this also kind of as a braid, an infinite braid. So, you know, people like braids. Here, so to speak, is infinity. And then I can think of tau 1 as this guy goes over. So these are strands going over. This, so to speak, is tau 1. Then I can think of tau 2. This guy goes under. This is tau 2. And tau 1 again, I go over. And this whole composition is phi. That's sort of this, what the braid is. So each of these little lines just means take this counter set and just move it around in kind of the obvious way. All right, so this is sort of a movie. If you like, there's a two-dimensional plane somehow. So this is the sphere. Minus infinity gives me the plane. Minus the cataset gives me the plane minus the cataset. This is a one-parameter family of motions of the plane minus a cataset. And the uh, isotopy class of this one-parameter family of motions is the given mapping class. Okay, so this is a usual way of drawing like mapping classes as braids. If you're familiar with that uh, picture. So what we want to do is to look at how phi acts um, on a ray. And it doesn't really matter which ray we choose, but they sort of might as well sort of start with some kind of nice example. So let's sort of start. Here's infinity. Um, and I've got bits of counter set to the left and the right and so on. And so here's um, a nice choice of ray to start off with. Just a ray that heads out here looks like that. So that's a particular ray. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at what the effect of phi is on this ray. So there's two kind of equivalent ways of thinking of what phi does. So if I think of this guy moves to the next guy by um, doing a little dance around infinity, it kind of goes, so to speak, like that. This is equivalent. I could redraw this picture by saying that what infinity does, instead of like thinking of infinity staying fixed and these things moving around, I could think of these things staying fixed and I could think of infinity moving. That's a little bit easier because it's only one point that's being moved rather than the whole kind of counter set. So what I can do is I can think of instead of this guy going around like that, I could think of infinity equivalently goes around like that. Yeah? So this is kind of the same thing. I mean, just up to a homeomorphism. So let's see, what's the effect of doing this on this ray? Well, so the ray goes from this point on the counter set to infinity. And if I take infinity and make infinity move in a little dance around here, I just take this ray and I drag it around. And I see what happens. So I drag the ray R around by the motion of infinity. Um, and so, I mean, so here is infinity and there's the ray sort of here. So as I move, do this thing here, I sort of start to drag this. I can drag it around like that. So I'm dragging it. And now I have to drag it all the way over here. Okay, so when I drag it over here, I want to get an isotopy class of ray. So this ray is going to get pushed along by this motion. So this is, uh, so I'm going to draw it like that. Sorry, so infinity is kind of being pushed along like this. So this is sort of uh, the picture here. 
And at the end, um, when I've moved it all the way, I get, well, uh, so that's sort of the end of the motion. <coughs> So this ray here, this ray here is the effective phi on the ray R, okay? So what I did, I mean, you could see the, the original ray R just went straight off to this guy. The new guy, well, I kind of going to redraw this slightly. I kind of pull this thing down a little bit, um, and I get a ray that does that, and I have the sock around it, um, and then this thing, at some point, um, this thing goes and does that, and then that guy just comes along and comes here. So the effect was, instead of having a ray that just went straight from infinity to its neighbor, I kind of just stuck a sock around it. So the original ray R, let me draw that in yellow. So this is the original ray R. I hope you can sort of see this. So this is the array R, and the array phi of R just puts a sock around R, and then just heads off to the next guy to give itself a bit of room. All right. So this can be uh, expressed kind of nicely uh, in the language of train tracks. Um, so if I kind of have this picture like this, this is the ray R, here's infinity. Um, The ray phi of R, I can draw it um, instead of, so I can, okay, so I'm just draw it like that. Instead of drawing these things, th these three sort of strands separately, I kind of push them all together and I put the number three on it to indicate there's really three things there, three strands which are just going parallel. And then a loop sort of sp splits off and goes around here. So this is one, one, so this guy goes over here. So that's the picture. So this thing just gets a little bubble on it and then multiplies by three. So at the next level, what I do is I take this strand here and I push this guy around that guy in exactly the same way and the end result is to take this strand here and add another little bubble that goes on here and multiply by three. So at the next level, I get Draw it like that. Um, so you get this picture here. So this has got a one on it, and that's got a one on it, and this is three, this is three, and this is nine. And so this is so this is r, this is phi of r, this is phi squared of r and so on, and so, well, you can see that phi to the n of r it doesn't, you know, it's up to you to decide how big n is or something, but basically, apart from this sort of little bubble at the start, it just goes along like this, kind of indefinitely, and every time it gets to one of these, it sticks a little bubble on it. Etc. Um, and well, so what are the weights? So this is uh, 
3 to the n, 3 to the n minus 1, 3 to the n minus 2, 3 to the n minus 3, etc. Um, by the way, what's this little bubble here mean? So at the very end, we always have this picture heading out to infinity, um, and we have 3 to the n. Uh, well, there's only, there's exactly one thing which is going to infinity because this is, of course, this is a ray at every stage. So what that means, of course, is that we always have one here. And so what we have here is 3 to the n minus 1 over 2. Whatever that is. So that's, this guy here just splits. It's got one thing in the middle and then half on one side, half on the other. And this half kind of goes over like that. Okay. So there's a nice picture. We could think of the limit uh, as being described in very concrete terms. Um, we can take a square um, and we can kind of glue the top half to the bottom half by just this sort of twist here. So it's sort of an infinite interval exchange kind of map. Divide this guy into thirds and do glue it like this, then divide this guy into thirds and glue like that, then divide this guy into thirds and glue like that, etc. Or maybe I want to, well, okay, so this is uh, two thirds, this is, uh, uh, what is a third of two thirds? Is two ninths, two twenty sevenths, Etc. This is a half, a half, and we just sort of put horizontal lines here. So this sort of describes, uh, so to speak, the infinite limit. Um, and so I think this is kind of really more, more or less the end of the story. You can see that the nth iterate of phi applied to R is the result of taking the original R and putting a sock around it n times so that it has distance at least n from anything that R had to intersect. So in particular, it sort of heads off to infinity at linear speed. All right. So um, this is kind of nice. Uh, and uh, anyway, so it says that the action of gamma on the ray graph I mean, it could have been completely uninteresting. There might have been a global fixed point. Well, that sounds unlikely, but maybe there were bounded orbits or everything had bounded orbit. Also sounds not so great. But in fact, that's not true. There's lots of interesting elements that act loxodromically on the ray graph. So the dynamics is sort of somehow extremely interesting. Um, so now I want to talk about applications of this fact. Yeah, Victor. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, uh, in fact, in this argument, the thesis uh, of the Kantar set uh, are never subdivided. So, in fact, we can, uh, one could imagine contracting them into spoils. Uh, and uh, if instead of Kantar set, you've just taken all of your initial construction with a countable set of points, uh, would it give something? Uh, would no, I mean, it's certainly very interesting. You're right. So I talked about there was this map from the ray graph to um, of the Cantor set to the ray graph of finite collections of points. But actually, who cares about it being finite? We could have taken any uh, compact, uh, totally disconnected subset uh, of the plane and thought of a map, monotone map from the Cantor set to that set, given by crushing uh, some subsets. Uh, and there's a perfectly nice one Lipschitz map from the ray graph of the Cantor set to the ray graph of that set, whatever it is. And you could have some interesting mapping classes on one of these sets, which, gave, uh, which were, came from mapping classes uh, on the Cantor set that preserved this decomposition. So exactly as, as Victor says, there's a decomposition of the plane, non-trivial decomposition of the plane, these Cantor set is subdivided into these countably many pieces. We can crush each of these pieces to a point in a kind of a nice way. Um, and there's a resulting mapping class on uh, the plane minus this countable set. And the action on the ray graph of the plane minus that countable, countable set is in fact loxodromic. And since it sort of came from that action upstairs as a one Lipschitz map, you can see that the element, the mapping, the mapping 
on the, the ray graph here is also loxodromic. Um, what is interesting about this is that uh, it's, still it's still somehow infinite type. Even in this quotient, the plane is still, uh, you still have an infinite set in the plane. So this, you could have just said, well, let's just take a mapping class from um, the plane minus seven points and look at the action on the ray graph there and taken something loxodromic there and then lift it in some very boring way to an action of the mapping class group on the plane minus a counter set, and then we could have got loxodromic elements that way, but it's just sort of, that would be a little bit silly, it's just a way of taking this finite type mapping class and inserting it in this counter set in this sort of kind of boring way. Here we have something which is genuinely of infinite type, so I think the dynamics of it is extremely interesting, but Maybe there's a lot more to do. You can ask yourself, well, are there any interesting mapping classes which are really somehow getting in there to the, map, to the counter set itself and doing something extremely interesting in a way that's um, witnessed in terms of the large scale geometry of how it acts on uh, the mapping, uh, how it acts on the ray graph. Um, again, what's really important here to understand is like how the point infinity moves around. So really, like I said, instead of thinking of this as a motion of the, of the, the, the mapping class of the plane minus the counter set, in a sense, sense the counter set was completely static. We could sort of keep this counter set fixed and then just take infinity and move infinity around in an interesting way. So there's a sort of a subgroup of the mapping class group of the plane minus a counter set where the counter set is fixed and you just take infinity and you think of infinity is a point on the sphere, and you think of um, moving that point on the sphere around in the complement of the plane. So, so maybe I want to sort of say is the following thing. Let's look at gamma hat. Let's define this to be the mapping class group of the sphere minus, excuse me, a counter set. And then, of course, there's a surjective homomorphism from the mapping class group of the plane minus a counter set to the mapping class group of the sphere minus a counter set given by, well, the plane, it's got like one canonical end which is isolated, namely infinity. Just fill that in with a point. Any homeomorphism of the plane minus a counter set canonically fills in over that point to give you a homeomorphism of the sphere minus a counter set mapping classes map, give to you mapping classes, and so you have a nice surjective homomorphism. And exactly what you forget when you pass to this quotient is this marked point. So this marked point can move around in interesting ways in the sphere minus a counter set, um, and a motion which starts at infinity moves around and then comes back to where it starts, gives you an interesting mapping class here, and those are exactly the things that are uninteresting here, so this is sometimes called, well always called, the Berman exact sequence. So you have the fundamental group of the sphere minus the counter set, um, and since it's a fundamental group we need a marked point, and let's let the marked point be infinity, this is exactly the kernel. So this is a subgroup of the mapping class group of the plane minus a counter set, and that's really an element of that is what's happening here. The counter set itself somehow in the sphere, it's staying well, it depends how you want to sort of do it, uh, but you could think of it as doing something very uninteresting. Well, you could say either the counter set is stationary and it's infinity that's moving, or the counter set is moving and infinity is stationary, but in terms of the action on the ray graph, these are kind of essentially equivalent, or, or very closely related. And so really, um, where this interesting element is living, you can, by slightly modifying what's happening, you can, you can arrange for this interesting element phi to live in this subgroup. What I think is, um, what, what's interesting is that this, this seems to be somehow necessary for the following reason. So I'm about to talk about uh, interesting functions that you get on your group coming from its action on the ray graph. These functions are these quasimorphisms that I talked about recently. It's going to turn out that all interesting quasimorphisms on gamma actually live in this subgroup. 
So somehow all the interesting dynamics of gamma on the ray graph uh, is somehow living in this subgroup. Okay. So I now sort of want to speak, so to speak, want to transition to the next topic, which is the subject of quasimorphisms. And so, so that's exactly what I'm going to start talking about now. All right. So So if you have a group that turns up in dynamics, um, it's very hard to understand somehow dynamics in a group in general because the group's non-abelian. So one of the ways in which you want to sort of study a non-abelian group acting on some space is you look at homomorphisms from your group to an abelian group. And then you can sort of look at the image there and it can tell you something about how complicated an element of the group is by saying how complicated its image is in some abelian group. That's great if you have lots of homomorphisms to an abelian group, but many uh, interesting groups that turn up in dynamics, many transformation groups, uh, tend not only to have no interesting homomorphisms to abelian groups, but often no interesting homomorphisms at all. They're often simple groups. But in any case, many interesting groups that turn up in dynamics are perfect, that they have, they have no interesting homomorphisms to abelian groups at all. And so there's a very useful substitute, um, which also has kind of a lot of geometric content to it, and is very closely related to the idea of a homomorphism to an abelian group, and this is called a quasimorphism. So a, um, if G is a group, a quasimorphism is just a function from G to the real numbers for which there exists some least non-negative real number called the defect so that for any two elements, G and H, in the group, the value of psi on G times H differs from the value on G plus the value on H by a bounded amount where the bound does not depend on G and H. Okay, if you had a homomorphism to R, then psi of GH would be equal to psi of G plus psi of H. So maybe this is not a homomorphism, but this failure of this thing to satisfy the homomorphism property, the error term is bounded independently of G and H. It's very important that it's bounded independently of G and H. Okay, so there's some least number D with this property, and that's called the defect. So in particular, the defect is zero if and only if psi is a homomorphism. Um, so a very uninteresting example of a quasimorphism on any group is a bounded function. If the function just takes the value 6 on every element, for instance, well, that's not going to fail to satisfy this property, but it certainly, sorry, it fails to be a homomorphism, but it certainly satisfies this property in a very uninteresting way. So bounded functions on a group are quasimorphisms, meaning bounded in absolute value, are quasimorphisms, and homomorphisms are also quasimorphisms, and somehow the interesting quasimorphisms are everything else. So. Um, and there's a way of making this sort of a little bit more precise. <coughs> so um, we say a quasimorphism on a group is homogeneous if it's a homomorphism when restricted to cyclic subgroups. Psi of g to the n is n times psi of g for all elements of the group and for all integers. Okay, 
And if psi is an arbitrary quasimorphism, then I can define a new thing, a new function, by definition, to be the limit as n goes to, I guess I have to say, positive infinity of psi of g to the n divided by n. And so it's a fact that this limit exists, and the limit defines a new function, and this new function is a homogeneous quasimorphism. And in fact, the difference between psi and its homogenization is a bounded function. So I'll just say fact. One, the limit exists. Two, psi bar is a homogeneous quasimorphism. And three, the difference of these two functions is so this is my notation for a bounded function. C upper one subscript B of G. C for chains or cochains, if you like, meaning just functions. One, so C upper one, meaning one cochains, means literally just functions on the group. And the subscript B means bounded. So this means functions on the group which are bounded in absolute value. Okay, so I'll just write that again underneath. So this is functions on G bounded in absolute value. So in particular, so I'm going to define Q twiddle of G. This is just the space of all quasimorphisms. on G, um, it's a real vector space. If I have a quasimorphism and I multiply it by 6, I get another quasimorphism. The defect just multiplies by 6. If I have two quasimorphisms and I add them together, I get another quasimorphism. The defect just adds, or it's sub-additive. So this is a real vector space. And C1B of G is a vector subspace. And so there's a quotient. So in fact, this includes, and the quotient space I'm going to call of Q of G, this is isomorphic to, in fact, the space of homogeneous quasimorphisms. So this is going to be the homogeneous quasimorphisms. And so this is an exact sequence of real vector spaces, um, meaning just that the kernel of this map, well, okay, so that there is a map. This map is the homogenization map. Given a quasimorphism, you homogenize it, and their difference is a bounded function. And this is exact. Every homogeneous quasimorphism arises this way. In particular, I mean, this guy certainly includes. That's just a subspace. Um, and the, the kernel is exactly bounded functions. Okay, so this space is sort of a little bit not really what you want because who cares about bounded functions on a group? Well, okay, maybe it's interesting, but for our purposes, this is not, we don't care about bounded functions on a group. So this is sort of the more interesting space. And uh, so when you're talking about interesting quasimorphisms on a group, Usually you would maybe insist that these quasimorphisms are homogeneous just so that you know that it didn't really just come from something that's, that's kind of completely arbitrary. A bounded function on a group doesn't see any of the group structure. It's just a function on a set. Okay. All right. So H1 is a subspace of Q, and D vanishes exactly on that subspace H1. So in fact, you can look at Q mod H1. Oh, H upper 1, this just means homomorphisms to R. Yeah? If I have a group G, H upper 1 of G with coefficients in R is just homomorphisms from G to R. 
So a homomorphism is a perfectly good example of a homogeneous quasimorphism. It's exactly what it means to be a homogeneous quasimorphism with defect zero. And on this space, the defect um, becomes a norm, making this into a Banach space. So this is a Banach space. And for slightly uh, nefarious reasons, I'm going to put twice the defect. It turns out twice the defect is a slightly nicer norm. But anyway, it's a Banach space. One way to see that it's a Banach space is that it turns out to be the isometric dual of a normed vector space. So let me explain where that comes from. So a quasimorphism on a group, it's a homomorphism. It's like a homomorphism to an abelian group, but not quite. It's sort of the defect measures the failure of this map to be a homomorphism. So it's sort of the extent to which the defect has to be positive is telling you something about how the group fails to be abelian. So another way of measuring how a group fails to be abelian is to sort of look at the fact that pairs of elements fail to commute. If pairs of elements fail to commute, their commutator is non-trivial. And so another measure of the failure of a group to be abelian is given by, well, you look at commutators and you sort of try to say something quantitative about how many commutators do you need to express an element. So another kind of dual definition as follows, if G is a group, and let's let G be an element of the commutator subgroup, then the commutator length of G denoted CL of G is by definition the minimum number of commutators in G whose product is little g. So what's a commutator? If I have two elements, this means a, b, a inverse, b inverse. So it vanishes exactly when a and b commute. The commutator subgroup is the subgroup of g generated by commutators. The set of commutators is not typically a group. If you have an element of the commutator subgroup, by definition, you can write it as a product of commutators, but the number of commutators you need might be bigger than one. And so by definition, the commutator length is the minimal number of commutators that you need. And then the stable commutator length by definition is the limit as n goes to, I guess, positive infinity, although it wouldn't matter in this case, of the commutator length of g to the n divided by n. And again, the limit exists. <coughs> Satisfies some nice properties. It's a class function on the group, meaning it's invariant under any automorphism of the group, actually, not just inner automorphisms, but certainly inner automorphisms. Um, it's homogeneous. The commu stable commutator length of g to the n is n times the stable commutator length of g, or the absolute value of n times. Um, and uh, so sort of it's, it's a little bit like, well, g is just a set, so it's a little bit like a norm, but you can make it a norm in the following way. I can define for a formal sum of elements, I can define the commutator length of a formal sum of elements in a group. By definition, I can say, I can call this the minimum of the commutator length of 
I can take these fun group, group elements individually and I can multiply them together, but then the order in which I multiply them might matter. But so what I want to do is I look at, I multiply them together, but I can take any conjugate of them. So I'll just say G1, H1, G2, H2, GK to the HK. So this is the minimum over all HJ, and this just means G to the H just means the, the conjugate of H by G. So if I have a, just a collection of elements in a group, I look at all ways I can multiply together any conjugates of them. For each of them, I compute the commutator length, and I look at the minimum, and that's by definition the commutator length of a formal sum. And then the stable commutator length of this formal sum is, again, the limit of the commutator length of the nth powers divided by n. And now this function becomes uh, a function on, well, the abelian group generated by elements of G. So if you like, it's, a, it's, a, a, it's sort of a function on uh, chains, one chains in the group. But you can extend it by linearity. Um, well, it has to be, so if we define B1 of G to be the kernel when you abelianize G, all, always with coefficients in the real numbers. So this is just real linear combinations of elements in the group. This is ordinary homology of the group. If you like, it's the abelianization of G tensor with the real numbers. The kernel of this are the one boundaries in the sense of group homology. So I'm going to define B1 capital H of G to be just the quotient where I quotient out by, I say that G to the N is equal to N times G and I say that G is equal to any conjugate. That's an H, not an N. And this is a real vector space, and SCL becomes a nice, not quite a norm, but a pseudo-norm on this vector space. Uh, all right. So SCL is a pseudo-norm on this vector space. Pseudo-norm just means satisfies all the properties of a norm except it might be zero on some non-zero element. Um, if G is a hyperbolic group, then in fact it's an honest norm. So there's many cases where it's a norm, but anyway. Um, pseudonorm, and in general, the isometric dual of this vector space with this pseudonorm is homogeneous quasimorphisms mod homomorphisms with twice the defect norm. Okay, so this is a vector space with a pseudonorm on it but it has a well-defined isometric dual, and it's isometric dual, the, the dual of anything is a Banach space. So that proves that this is a Banach space. I mean, it's easier to see, but anyway, that's why it's a Banach space, because it's actually a dual space. Um, this is sometimes called generalized Bavard duality, and it's sort of a coincidence because this is not Juliet Bavard, it's actually uh, her father. Um, he didn't prove this statement, he proved uh, an analogous statement when you're talking about stable commutator lengths of individual elements, but anyway, this is, this is sort of a nice uh, fact, a fundamental sort of fact. Uh, Sometimes, yeah, so let's, let's call it generalized Bavard duality or just Bavard duality if you like. In particular, when you have a group and you want to know, are there any interesting homogeneous quasimorphisms on it, in particular those that don't come from just honest homomorphisms, well, that's equivalent to asking, is there an element, 
with non-trivial stable commutator length, with positive stable commutator length. So here's a fact, and I don't have time to prove this today, um, but I'm going to start by proving it tomorrow. There are no interesting homogeneous quasimorphisms on gamma hat. The mapping class group of the sphere minus a Cantor set has no interesting quasimorphisms. In fact, it's a perfect group and it's uniformly perfect. Every element is a product of at most three commutators. So stable commutator length is identically zero. And that implies, and I'll sort of say why again, that all interesting quasimorphisms on gamma, so this is the mapping class group of the plane minus a Cantor set, are those which come from an interesting quasimorphism on the sphere minus a Cantor set on pi one of that, and in fact only those which are invariant under the action of gamma hat. So actually I guess I should say this is a subset. So all the interesting quasimorphisms here come from this point pushing subgroup, taking infinity and pushing it around in the complement of the Cantor set in the, in, in the sphere, and then trying to find an interesting function on that, a homogeneous, quasi, uh, homogeneous function on that, which is natural in the sense that it's sort of invariant under the mapping class group. So it might look like there are no such things at all. In fact, there's many of them in infinite dimensional space, and one of the best known ways of constructing such quasimorphisms is when you have an isometric action of your group on a uh, delta hyperbolic space, and in fact, that's exactly what one can use the ray graph to do. Um, so I'll start talking about that tomorrow, but I think today I'm out of time. Yes, okay, good. Why a mapping class group of um, a plane without counter set is bigger than plane without an infinite num a countable number of points? Oh, uh, well, I mean they're both uncountable groups, so I don't know. If bigger is not is not maybe exactly the right statement, but the mapping class group of the plane minus let's say a countable number of points with one limiting to one, exactly one point. That set, the mapping class group of that injects into the mapping class group of the plane minus a Cantor set by just taking each one of those points and replacing it with a little Cantor set. So that gives you an inclusion one direction. So I don't know, bigger, but that's, you might, there are maps from the ray graph of one thing down to the ray graph of the other. That's a one Lipschitz map because adjacent rays give you adjacent or equivalent rays. Um, so given an interesting action of one of these other mapping class groups on its ray graph, you will get an interesting mapping class in the mapping class group of the plane minus a Cantor set on its ray graph. And you might say that the interesting ones are the ones that come from surfaces of infinite type. So that's that's all I wanted to say. That's all I was saying about yeah, that. But yeah. I, I'm trying to understand. Do, is it obvious that if you move something inside, a kind of around a country set, do you have something which is not coming from just elements that uh, separates the components? I mean, are you asking somehow about the point pushing subgroup? Yes. Maybe that's the question. Yes. Yeah. So this is. I mean, this is a, this Berman exact sequence is. Um, there's a few different ways to to, to sort of. Uh, prove this, but this is really nothing to do with the finiteness of the surface. If I have any surface S at all, I can look at the mapping class group of the surface S, and then I can look at the mapping class group of the surface fixing a point in that surface. And the mapping class group fixing a point surjects onto the mapping class group not fixing the point by just forgetting where the point is. And the kernel of the map is, well, where did the point go? And where does it go? It goes by some homotopy class of loop, which is to say something in pi one. So this Berman exact sequence, it's for any surface at all. When you have a surface and you have a point in that surface, the mapping class group of the surface fixing the point surjects onto the mapping class group of just the surface ignoring the point with kernel pi one of the surface based at that point, yeah. Anyway, other questions? <laughs> 
when you are defining the communicator net, uh, so you write the program stand, uh, the program stand, so you don't need to be a vegan, I think. Yeah, so the question was about defining the commutator length of a formal sum of elements. Writing it as a formal sum strongly suggests it should be independent of the order in which I put those elements down here. That's exactly why um, I allow myself to conjugate all these elements. Right? The product of G and H, it's not equal to the product of H and G, but it's the product of a conjugate of H with G. So if I allow myself just freely to conjugate each of these elements by independent elements in the group, then the result is independent of the order. Yeah, so there's a geometric way of thinking about this. If I think of a group as pi one of a space, a element in the group is a based loop, a conjugacy class is a free homotopy class of loops, the commutator length of an element is asking for the least genus of a surface mapping to your space whose boundary is the given element, the commutator length of a formal sum is, I think of these elements as a bunch of free homotopy classes, and I ask for the least genus of a map of a surface with that many boundary components mapping to the space such that the boundary components each wrap around individually these elements. So describing it in these geometric terms as maps of surfaces and minimal <laughs> genus of maps of surfaces makes, makes the commutativity, and for that matter, the, the meaning of it much more clear, I think. All right. Other questions? So thank you.